thing. Hello to everyone in our audience, both live and virtually. Thank you for coming to attend this screening as part of OFA 2020, the ninth annual Oakville Film Festival. My name is Tyler Collins. I'm one of the festival hosts this year. In addition, I'm also the arts writer for Oakville News. You can read us about movies, entertainment, local news, and more for free every day at oakvillenews.org. <laughs> We have just finished a screening of the fabulous feature, The Lost Girls, and now uh, we have got this pre-recorded Q&A session with one of the great talents of the movie. She was the screenwriter, the director, a producer, and appeared in the cast as Wendy. We are joined virtually from Europe now today, Livia DePaulis. Livia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Now, I didn't ask at the beginning, Livia, where are you Zooming from today? Well, actually, you said Europe, but I'm in London, which is Europe. But, yes. you know. <laughs> I knew it was somewhere, I knew it was somewhere, but didn't, I forgot to ask in advance. This is how you know uh, in the audience that we are, in fact, live. Now, normally for some of these features, you can submit questions to us, but because this is being pre-recorded in advance of the festival, we just have this short featurette for you to enjoy, whether you're currently at the wonderful film.ca cinemas, or if you're watching this with your family from home. If you bought a virtual ticket, you'll have access to this film for 24 hours following when you started watching, or until the end of day on Wednesday, June 29th. Now, Livia, let's talk to you about your absolutely fabulous film. Uh, <laughs> as we said in the beginning, you, you wore multiple hats for this production. You were on camera, you wrote this, you were a producer, and you were a director. How did you balance all of these responsibilities in various stages of the filmmaking process? Um, okay, so, you know, as a producer, I have to say that, you know, once we actually started production, you know, I had two more producers. Uh, there was Sam Tipperhale that was basically, you know, running the set and Peter Touche, who was handling, you know, all the documents and stuff like that. Um, so once production started, I was really just directing and acting. Uh, <laughs> um, but basically, so I wrote the script and in the writing on the script, um, it was very intertwined with um, the building up, the, the working on the character for me, uh, because I was living in New York at the time. And in New York, I have studied acting for many years with um, this very renowned um, acting teacher called Susan Batson. And she has groups that kind of get together and workshop things and, um, you know, plays or, you know, different type of materials. Some people like um, work on like one, one person shows. And so I brought uh, some scenes of the script into that workshop and that really kind of informed the screenplay. So I would write something, I would go into the workshop, I would workshop it with other actors and the discoveries that were very, organic and experiential that I would make on the character, I would then bring back to the script. Uh, and I thought that was very useful because not just for me as an actress, but also, you know, being um, a, a literary work, um, it was important to, 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 to feel, for me to feel that it was actually real and it was believable to me that, that she could talk in this way or that she could, you know, that she could live this this journey let's talk about your adaptation because the lost girl started as a novel written by somebody else and then you did the adaptation of it for the screen so what what was that experience like of taking somebody else's story and adapting it to the camera but then also tell me how did those workshops change your writing process yeah, well, you know, the, the, the adaptation process is a process of mm -hmm. focusing and zooming into certain aspects. And it, it was quite complex, I have to say. It required many, many different drafts. What were some uh, of those aspects? 
Um, so I always say, so when I first, I first read the novel in 2003, so a long time ago. And at the time I wasn't even thinking about, you know, being a filmmaker. I was just, you know, I was trying to be an actress in the theater. That's what I was doing when I first read the, the, the novel um, in New York. And uh, the, the aspects that resonated with me the most back then, um, the, the book is much darker than the film. And so I was a young adult and I was very drawn towards the struggle uh, because I was experiencing a, a struggle in, in growing up. And then eventually in the screenwriting process, uh, I started to um, pay more attention to the dynamics between mothers and daughters because we have four generations here. And so I wanted to, I was interested in seeing you know, I would say you learn how to be a mother. I'm not a mother, but <laughs> I'm thinking that you learn. I'm also how to not be a mother. That's okay. <laughs> um, you learn how to be a mother from your mother. I would assume, right? You learn a lot from your mother, but you kind of. And so I started to to think about, okay, what about what kind of a mother would this woman be, and the daughter of this woman, what kind of a mother would she be? And then the granddaughter of this woman, what kind of a mother would she be? And so um, that was, that became, um, I guess, more the focus of the film um, in the so screenwriting. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about working in the Peter Pan world, because this is one of the most universally known, aware, and, and adapted works in the history of the English language. Right, yeah. so many people are touched by the concept of Peter Pan. So, what made this this introspection different for you? What, yeah, what I, makes I, the Lost Girls different from other Peter Pan works? Yeah, well, it's clearly very different. Uh, but I think that you know, it is um, you know, it's clearly Peter Pan is clearly a masterpiece, and that's why it's been inspiring writers and filmmakers for century really and everybody has their own way in and something specific that they get touched uh, by in the story mm. i think that it, it's it's so um it's so appealing it's so inspiring for other artists because peter pan really represents the power of imagination and uh this idea of make-believe which is so um so uh, cherished and so dear to any kind of artist, right? And specifically fiction, specifically fiction, right? So um, fiction writers. So, so um, in my case, again, it, it being that it's an adaptation, we have to recognize Lori Fox's first idea and her take in looking at the women and taking the very last chapter of Peter Pan, which is titled When Wendy Grew Up, which is actually ended up being a scene in the film, a very touching scene when Peter Pan comes back and Wendy, you know, the original Wendy Dar Darling has grown up and that, and he wants her to go back with him to Neverland and she can't because she's grown up and she's forgotten how to fly. And then he will take her daughter and then her daughter and so it will go on forever. So that scene is actually in the original story from 1911 and it's the last chapter and it's not very well known. Uh, That's in the original J.M. Barry novel. Yes, it is. It's called, It's a. It's. it was a, um, a chapter that was added in uh, 2000, um, see, 2000 <laughs> in 1911, and it wasn't always printed in the. In Why not? The, because I guess it was. It, it was called when Wendy grew up an afterthought, and it's a very very moving um, scene, um, and uh, it just kind of got you know it wasn't it wasn't. Um, used in the Disney version. And so it hasn't become very, you know, very well known. Um, and so that's the fact that Lori first, Lori Fox first and myself took on that, like we started from that specific scene 
uh, made this work very different. One of the lines that stood out to me from from the movie was said by Hook, uh, Ian Glenn's portrayal of Hook, that says, Neverland gives us the gift of true freedom. Uh, Tell me, what does that philosophy of Neverland teach us about what is right and wrong? Right, the, the moral. <laughs> yeah. um, well, so the idea is that, so Neverland gives us the gift of true freedom is because, um, you know, if you basically drop off and, 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 and leave in this world of the imagination, you get to make the rules, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get to say what's right or wrong in a world, in a, in a, in a way, um, if you think of a child and if you think of the world that a child would build around themselves, um, the child will always be the king and the child will always say what's right and what's wrong. And, uh, and how does that you know, move into the real world? That is, <laughs> that is the problem. Mm -hmm. That is what becomes problematic, right? Because once you move into the real world, you have to deal with other people and you have to deal with other um, universes because every person has got its own universe and you have to kind of cooperate <laughs> and you have to communicate and cooperate and understand. And, and so you have to set, um, you know, what's called the common sense. It's called common sense because it's, it's the meaning, right? It's the meaning of what's happening that's get shared, right? It's a shared meaning. So in Neverland, the only shared meaning is that anything goes, is make-believe. Mm -hmm. That's the prime, prime meaning of the Neverland. Let's move on to talking about some of the, the amazing actors that you got to work with in this cast, because uh, you have some really uh, talented people who were working with you on this. Tell me about your experience working with several members of the ensemble. Um, so, it was, um, you know, kind of surreal for me to be able to work with, you know, Vanessa Redgrave and Jolie Richardson and Ian Glenn. Mm -hmm. And so working with Vanessa for me was incredibly inspiring to see a woman, you know, Vanessa's in her eighties and, uh, you know, she's, she's acting and she's acting really well. <laughs> as you can see um even to just like remember the lines if you think about it i can't even remember like people's names sometimes you know um let alone like lines memorizing lines and actually perform with actors that you know because of the nature the independent nature of the of the film and the budget you know there was there wasn't really like a table read or rehearsals you know the the other act i had time to prepare but like the other actors just met on set um and i think vanessa just kind of brought uh, a lot of the performances um up in a way right because she's so glorious and so shiny um and jolie jolie was also um her approach to the role um, was very intimate and I think she did a wonderful job and uh, um, yeah and that's all I, I can say about her and then I can say about Ian Glenn he is an absolute delight as a person and as an actor he's a classically trained actor he can do whatever and I um you know, I absolutely love. And he was so committed to this hook that I wrote that is so kind of wacky and weird. And... Well, a lot of Captain Hook portrayals are wacky and weird. Yeah, um, true, true. <laughs> uh, yes, but I, I think you're right. There's a lot of grounding and nuance to what he's doing, right? There's a sophistication to him and that plays really well. Uh, I'm curious, out of uh, out of the cast, is there someone you had to really work at to convince them to be part of the movie? Who who was the hardest to book into the cast? No, I have no. To say, I have to say, I was very lucky. I I, you know, I I 
I take it as a huge compliment that these people just, uh, you know, they, they accepted to play the part just by reading the script. Um, I did not know these people <laughs> and, uh, you know, as I said, it wasn't a huge budget uh, and I was very, you know, I take it as, uh, mm -hmm. as a, you know, a, 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 as a compliment. Yeah. I take it as a compliment uh, that, you know. That so one of the things you had to do was direct yourself on camera while directing the rest of the movie. What is that experience like directing yourself amongst this ensemble? Right, so um, the process, I'm gonna be quite specific, is, um, it's very simple, I'm no, just kidding. Uh, basically in the scenes uh, in which I'm, I'm, I'm acting, obviously I can't really, um, you know, stop and start. So everything has to be discussed ahead of time. So we would, you know, discuss the scene and set it up and, you know, block it a little bit and discuss it with the, with the director of photography, you know, everything has to be um, set up. And then, um, and then, and then I would go for a few runs, right? I would, I would go for a few takes in a row without cutting. Uh, we would just run the, the bit of the scene that we were doing uh, a few times. And um, having a theater background, um, I think, mm -hmm. I believe you can sense energetically if the scene is working or not, if it feels, you know, when it feels organic. So if, you know, when we would get to a take that felt organic enough, then I would stop, I would go behind the monitor, it would be played back to me because I really needed to see what I was doing and what everybody right. was doing. And then I would give like some adjustments to, um, to the other actors and to myself. And for certain scenes, more complex scenes, I had uh, my teacher, uh, my, my beloved, you know, the, the person that I worked with in this workshop, I had her on Zoom and so she was- So she was, was with you on, on deck. Right, even if she was there virtually, but she was there to help coach. To for certain, for certain scenes, for certain, not for the whole thing. Obviously, like if I'm like just having a cup of coffee, I'm just having a cup of coffee, right? <laughs> but for the more uh, complex scene, I just kind of uh, felt the need to have somebody telling me, "I think you got it," or mm, "I think you should do this one more time," or even to just be like you know, move your hands. Hmm. <laughs> like, you know, like something very simple that, you know, when you're in the midst of it, it's great to have another, another set of eyes and somebody that I really trust and somebody that really understood what I was trying to do. We are almost out of time. Uh, but before we go, I have one more question I want to ask you. Um, the short film that was attached to this for the screening is called The Ferryman. And the short film opened with a title card quoting David Henry Thoreau, in which it says, of what significance are the things you can forget? Oh, wow. You can and I thought forget. that was such a great companion piece and concept to introduce the world of the Lost Girls, because we talked about the intergenerational play of, of this experience going down from grandmother to mother to daughters, and that cycle continuing. Hearing that, and I'll say it again, of what significance are the things you can forget? How does that complement the message of the Lost Girls? Well, definitely, you know, um, uh, I think uh, I think there was an earlier version of the trailer that actually said the stories we can't forget uh, are, are, are the ones that make you who you are or something. I don't remember, but it's really... Um, what sticks there, right? In the positive and in the negative, that absolutely influences us, you know, our, our, our mode of existence, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I bet this is something that anybody can relate to because we all have 
things in the families that have been, you know, family stories that have been told over and over and over again. And you kind of grow up knowing that grandpa did this or grandma did that that day or that happened or, and, uh, and also on a personal level in your own journey, there are things that, um, in the past, as I said, both in the positive then in, and in the negative, uh, um, that you experience at some point through the journey and you just cannot forget. And so that informs the way you then continue to evolve. Is this making sense? Yes, it is. Well said. Um, Livia DePaulis, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, to our audience, you just got to see the Canadian premiere of The Lost Girls. Uh, well, it comes out in the UK and the US a week ago when you're watching this. You were the first audience in Canada to get to see this. Uh, it will be coming out later this summer, but on behalf of OFA, uh, our technical director, Wendy Donnan, who's hiding off camera, uh, thank you, our audience, for joining us for this very special screening. On today, the last in-person day for OFA, we still have a couple other movies that are coming up, including screenings here at the cinema tonight or virtually on Monday and Tuesday. Livia, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet you. We hope you all enjoy the rest of the ninth annual Oakville Film Festival. Have a good night, everyone.